And now, the only survival show to survive a zombie tutu rampage. In this episode, we sit down with famed gunsmith Ed Vandenberg. He's going to set us straight on understanding rifles for shooting to a thousand yards. Howdy and welcome to In the Rabbit Holes Urban Survival Podcast. This is episode 146. I'm your host, Aaron, and you are in the rabbit hole. Safe and sound. Ed, welcome to the show. Hello. So now, you are a gunsmith, and fairly famous gunsmith, especially uh, in these parts here. And we brought you on specifically today to talk about a topic that doesn't, it gets a lot of play on the internet, but not necessarily from people that usually really know what they're talking about. Right. So now we're going to talk today about precision rifles, particularly rifles built to shoot in the 500 to 1,000 yard range. And a lot of what we're going to talk about today assumes we most part, take the shooter out of the equation because that's not something we can really do anything about. So to start, I guess let's start with action. Are bolt-action rifles inherently more accurate than semi-auto rifles? Well, the short answer is yes, but it's, I guess, more a function of the the feeding characteristics of the action rather than the way the actions lock up and the way that they feed rounds and such. You know, semi-automatic rifles come in are a pretty wide range in the United States. You know, AR pattern rifles are obviously the most common, but we find, you know, tons and tons of Kalashnikov pattern rifles, you know, FALs, L1A1s, H&Ks, FN Brownings. Uh, Remington and Winchester both make some sporting semi-automatic systems. For the most part, they're all rotating bolts type actions, but not all. You know, the HK clearly is a delayed roller lock. The FAL and L1s are a tilting breech block type system. The big deal about accuracy with respect to the action is is that it needs to, to present the cartridge to the chamber and the barrel consistently. And uh, I think really where the advantage, the advantage goes to the bolt-action rifles in that the feeding on bolt action rifles is much more gentle with respect to the cartridges being slammed into a feed ramp under, you know, some pretty serious spring pressure. You know, the cyclic rate of most of these automatic rifles is 750 to about 900 RPM. So that's those, the, the reciprocating bolts and bolt carrier groups are moving really fast and they tend to, they tend to damage bullets upon feeding. So, yeah, the, like I said, the short answer is yes, bolt actions tend to be more accurate than, than automatic rifles. So now when you say it damages the, is it damaging the bolt or is it damaging the uh, the case or how is that? Mostly damaging the projectiles. An, an extreme example would be, say, uh, a, um, a semi-automatic rifle in two forty three Winchester. The two forty three Winchester is a small little 6 millimeter bullet, you know, in a, in a basically a three oh eight case neck down to 6 millimeter is 243 Winchester. Most of those projectiles are designed for varmints and small game, and therefore those projectiles are pretty fragile. They generally have either uh, some sort of Lexan plastic tip or some other type of hollow point that allows them to have really uh, explosive terminal ballistic performance. That same projectile does not take the beating uh, of the feed cycle of an automatic rifle very well. So they, they tend to tend to damage the projectile itself. In extreme examples, yes, it can actually bend the cartridge case neck. Hmm. So a, a larger caliber full metal jacket bullet will tend to take the feed cycle of an automatic rifle much more gracefully than, well, one of these smaller sporting caliber type cartridges in the semi-automatic rifle. So now, and actually, we should probably back up for a minute, and I know we, we were going back and forth about this, and I want to make sure we get it in, that with someone like you, it's these things can actually, accuracy by itself, you know, a lot of people, especially going back to the internet, can throw around the word accuracy or precision, but for you, 
And for people that really are into that stuff, it has a lot more meaning than just perhaps the average person. So let's have a, a quick conversation about what is what is precision. And, and there's a lot of shades of gray in there. Let's break for a few quick messages. A quick question for listeners. Do you get at least a buck's worth of value from each episode? Did you know that would add up to roughly $4.33 a month worth of value you get each month over a year from ITRH? Now, for as little as $2.50 a month, ITRH Roving Horde Armada members keep the show going. Plus, members get a whole lot more than just the show. Check it out and help us keep the lights on by becoming a member today. Visit itrh.net to find out more about becoming an ITRH Roving Horde Armada member. Next, be sure to listen all the way through to the very end of today's show. Lauren Wilson, author of The Art of Eating Through the Zombie Apocalypse, has graciously provided some very special and very tasty Halloween treats and recipes for the Roving Horde. If you're new here, that's you. This will make for fun Halloween dishes and help you eat well should the zombies rise. Now, back to Ed Vandenberg with his explanation of what precision actually is in a precision rifle. Right. Well, precision is, is kind of a nebulous term, but I, I would look at it more like a scale, whereas people who are professional shooters, people like David Tubb, that have made a whole career out of precision shooting, law enforcement snipers, people like that, you know, they, the level of accuracy that they require that they would call precision is down in the, in the tenths of a minute of angle, 0 0.1, 0 0.2 MOA. That's acceptable accuracy for those people. For the U.S. military, uh, precision standards are usually two to three minutes of angle, which the, the average consumer that buys a sporting deer rifle would find that level of accuracy unacceptable. So, you know, in the U.S. commercial market these days, one minute of angle is considered roughly the standard for precision. Uh, a minute of angle is approximately one inch at 100 yards. Technically, it's one inch and 47 thousandths. But for all intents and purposes, center to center, one inch, that's considered one minute of angle. And that's what most people take as a generic term for precision. Moving on to ammunition. How big of a role does, there's, there's a lot of stuff going on here when we talk about ammunition, but just to talk about caliber itself, how big, how big of a role does caliber actually play in the accuracy? And I guess when I say caliber, I'm referring to kind of the whole cartridge package. Right. So caliber, that term can be used in a couple different ways. You know, in, in the firearms industry, generally we talk about caliber, we're talking about projectile diameter. If you take a, a 30 caliber carbine is a little bitty, a really small cartridge that shoots a 308 diameter bullet compared to a 300 Remington Ultra Mag, which is a gigantic casing that shoots the same 30 caliber or .308 bullet. They're both 30 caliber, but they're at opposite ends of the continuum. Mm. Caliber with respect to a cartridge is, is a whole different deal. And the, and the, the cartridge, again, the example of the 30 caliber carbine in the 300 Remington Ultra Mag, the, the little carbine cartridge, you know, has a capacity of, of 21 grams of water, whereas the 300 Remington Ultra Mag holds 110 grains of, of grams of water. So that that when we talk about caliber in that instance, we're talking about the cartridge casing or the chamber of the firearm. So caliber can be used kind of interchangeably and you almost need to have context to know exactly what people are talking about. Mm -hmm. But uh, with respect to accuracy, generally speaking, all of the things being held equal, accuracy will go to the larger diameter, moderate velocity cartridge. Again, that's one of those things where everything else is held constant because the larger projectile diameter has more air, surface area on the rifling that, that it will stabilize. And the bullet in moderate velocity ranges tends to be much more stable. Mm. What would be, I guess, a range of a, a moderate velocity? Well, moderate velocity, and, and there's some things that happen to projectiles when, when they pass different velocities. So at about 
3,250 feet per second, there's a destabilizing harmonic that happens to a projectile. And then again, when it makes a transonic shift from supersonic, you know, faster than the speed of sound, to subsonic, below the speed of sound. Both of these transitional periods in a bullet flight cause a somewhat destabilizing harmonic. So ideally, we want the velocity of the projectile as it leaves the firearm to be slightly under 3250, and we want the projectile to contact a target somewhere before it reaches subsonic velocity. And that's generally accepted as transition to subsonic is generally considered the effective range of a given rifle caliber combination. Mm. So that moderate range of velocity, there's some 22 centerfire wildcats that drive bullets so fast that the centrifugal force on the projectile will actually scatter the bullet. Hmm. The bullet will come apart as it leaves the muzzle of the rifle. Generally, you know, these are, these are cartridges that make 45, 4,600 feet per second. And they, they, they literally scatter the bullet. There's some bigger calibers out these days that will drive bullets, you know, beyond that 3250 range. They're rarely the most accurate, though. So I believe ideally we want the projectile to leave the muzzle just slightly under 3250 and then, like I said, again, contact the target before it goes subsonic. Mm-hmm. I guess in the 500 to 1,000 yard range, what are some examples of these cartridges? Yeah, probably the most popular is going to be 308 Winchester. Uh, you know, any any cartridge that's seen military service is going to be guaranteed popularity in the civilian market. That's just that's just a rule of nature. Hmm. So 308 is probably the most popular. Uh, certainly, any any of the the commercial Magnum calibers like 7 millimeter Remington Magnum, 300 Winchester Magnum. Th- those cartridges are going to be, you know, really at home in that 500 to 1,000 yard range. Shooting a thousand yards with a 308, people can do that on a regular basis. And again, it's probably the most popular target rifle round in the world. But it's a little short in the range as far as shooting a thousand yards. Like I said, people can do it, but generally they shoot heavier projectiles at lower velocities to get it to stretch out that far. Mm. But those calibers are really popular. The, the, the 260, 6.5 millimeter caliber range these days is real popular as well. Mm-hmm. Which is interesting. Yeah, I started hearing a lot. I mean, I know it's been around for a long time, but I've been hearing a lot more about it more recently. People more interested in punching holes in paper than necessarily animals or en- enemy targets. And I know that the 260 starts to drop down below that 30 caliber mark what is it about that bullet that makes it so or that i guess that round or cartridge however we want to phrase it so it's such a flat shooter right well 6.5 millimeter or 260 and in the decimal equivalent would be 0.264 the 6.5 is has seen a real resurgence in the last i guess maybe 25 years or so it was extremely popular i guess with a lot of rifles coming back from the wars in in europe 65 by 55 Swede is probably the oldest example of that, and it, and it dates back to like 1895. But 6.5 r- represents the, uh, what a lot of people feel like is the ideal compromise between projectile weight and diameter with respect to ballistic performance and even terminal ballistic performance in a lot of disciplines. 260 Remington dominates metallic silhouette uh, shooting, some of the other 6.5 cartridges, like 6.5-284, those are real popular with F-class shooters. 6.5 Creedmoor is a, is a relatively new cartridge that, that Hornaday has come out with, and they're, they're really promoting that hard. Uh, Lapua, the same company that developed the 338 Lapua, has a 6.5 by 47 Lapua, which is, is a, a kind of a specialized cartridge but it, it has a pretty loyal following with competitive shooters as well. Mm. So, yeah, 260 is a very popular caliber, and the 260 Remington is that same, like the 243 Winchester is a, is a 308 case, neck down to 6 millimeter. 260 Remington is a 308 case, neck down to 6.5 millimeter. Okay. And now I also know, like, 270 is a pretty, it's mostly popular with hunters, it's, it's always seemed to me. Right, right. And 270 Winchester is largely responsible for that. 
You know, 270 Winchester is basically a 30 uh neck down to take a .277 projectile. And it's real popular for the same reason the 260 or the, the 6.5 millimeter is, because your bullet weight for a given diameter yields higher ballistic coefficients, and and it's it's a very efficient cartridge, and it generates less recoil than than the larger rifles. Now, you know, recoil is a very subjective thing, and mm-hmm. you'll if you talk to 10 different people and get them to describe the recoil of a given firearm. You'll get everything from, oh my gosh, it almost ripped my shoulder off to, oh, that's nothing. Yeah. <laughs> so, because it's very subjective, but most people tend to perceive the recoil of a 270 caliber rifle as less than, say, a 30 out 6. And so, 270 is very popular. 270 has also uh, been adapted for or used for 6.8 uh, millimeter SPC which was a, a cartridge developed for AR-15s, mm-hmm. and it shoots that same .277 diameter bullet, but because of the limited case capacity, tends to work with lighter projectiles. So the the 90 to about 120 grain bullet weight is about typical for that 6.8 SPC, whereas 270 Winchester, most people shoot from 130 to about 150 grain bullets. A couple things to, to back up on, and I know the especially in discussing 260 versus 270, and this Mm kind of goes back to action, we get into short action versus long action uh, when it comes to bolt action rifles. Is there any any real difference there between those two uh, other than the physical characteristics? Well, like like you said, the 260, uh, especially the 260 Remington, is is meant to be a short action caliber. So not only will it work fine in bolt rifles, but it will also work uh, work well in rifles that were done, designed to shoot 308 Winchester. So you could take an AR-10 or uh, a built uh, FAL from 260 Remington caliber, and those are, are outstanding performers. The 270 Winchester is a long-action cartridge, and so your your choices as far as clearly there's tons of bolt rifles in, in 270 Winchester. Your choices for long-action semi-automatic rifles are much more narrow and tend to be more rifles designed for sporting use, say like a 742 Remington or something to that effect, or or some of the Browning gas-operated semi-automatic hunting rifles. Those rifles tend to be a little lighter duty than some of the basic military design rifles. They were originally designed to be light enough to carry for hunting purposes, And it's not something that people are going to go out and shoot thousands and thousands of of rounds through. Mm -hmm. The military designs tend to follow the the paradigm that, you know, you shoot the barrel out of it, you send it back to the armory, have it refit, put it back into service. The sporting designs are designed to shoot, you know, maybe a box of shells a year through them, you know, and you shoot it for 10 or 15 years. And then that's kind of the service life of those rifles. So I think that if if someone's going to, put a rifle into service and intend to shoot a lot of ammo through it, one of the, the uh, military-type designs is going to serve you longer. Okay. We can't get away from ammo without discussing match grade versus roll your own. What is what is the real difference there? Well, you know, some of the match grade ammunition that's on the market today is as good as has ever been produced. And the technology just keeps increasing maybe not to the extent that, say, computers or automotive technology is increased, but it's, ammunition these days is, is as good as it's ever been. So you can generally buy ammunition that's suitable for match-grade accuracy. You know, it, it tends to be really expensive, but that's the option for people who don't want to reload. Reloading is almost like a discipline unto itself, and it requires the same type of time and money commitment like a lot of disciplines that we <laughs> subject ourselves to. <laughs> and, you know, some people have, have the time and the money and also the space because it does take take up an appreciable amount of space to set up to reload ammunition. That said, uh, you can generally load the ammunition for a, a small fraction of what you would buy ammunition for, and there's a certain satisfaction in developing your load's to be exactly what you want them to be. You can tailor a load for a specific firearm and yield accuracy beyond what the factory ammunition can yield. You brought up an interesting point about 
the a fraction of the cost. I guess especially with match grade, it sounds like. But at what point does the investment? I mean, a lot of times we do stuff and we can't make back our investment of time necessarily. But at what kind of average area of production does reloading actually end up paying for itself? You know, I, I don't know that people would be well advised to try to to look at it in terms of how long it would take to pay out. You know, like a business that buys a piece of equipment, generally people consider about a five-year payout to be a reasonable. And, and I don't know that I would look at the reloading thing quite that way in, in so far as, and, and not only that, but there's a pretty wide range of equipment that you can buy to reload. So you can start reloading, get just basic equipment, and probably start reloading for about $250 worth of the equipment. A single-stage press, a triple-beam type powder scale, some dies, you can get into it, like I said, for, for about $250 or so. Now, that said, if you go out and buy a, a Dillon 1050 progressive press, the basic press without any accessories is over $1,000. So, you know, by the time you get that all rigged out, you'll probably have $1,500, $2,000 in that. Mm. So, you know, I don't I don't know that we could compare apples to apples that way and say, okay, here's here's the point, uh, you know, where we've we've paid out. Or, well, we've gone too far, and now we've reached a point of diminishing returns. You know, I, don't, I don't know that you can look at it that way. If you think about going out and buying a box of really good match-grade, you know, centerfire rifle ammo, and average, say, you're going to spend $65 on that box of 20 rounds. Mm. You can reload that box of 20 rounds for about, you know, depending on what projectiles you buy and what powder and all, I'm saying you could probably reload it for five or six. Oh, wow. That's... So, yeah, so it's a significant difference, but again, there's a time commitment, there's some equipment and, you know, a learning curve and you've got, again, you've got to have the space to do it. So mm-hmm. I don't, I don't know that I would make a dollars and cents decision so much as I would factor in all those other, all those other things. You know, that's probably one of the best explanations of, of reloading ammunition I've ever heard. Thank you, Ed. <laughs> Because I have, I've always personally looked at it as, well, there's got to be a break-even point and always looked at it monetarily or looked at it as I'm trying to get into and find the time to really get into extending my shooting out past 500 yards. And so I was looking at it for those purposes, but that's, that's a really interesting way of looking at it. Thank you. So now, before leaving ammo, this is really the difference between external ballistics and terminal ballistics. And I know okay. I'm actually making a little bit of an error there. Well, no, 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 no. That you're describing different, different things. There's, there's actually three categories of ballistics. There's internal ballistics, external ballistics, and terminal ballistics. Internal ballistics deals with what happens inside the firearm when you pull the trigger and gas starts expanding and stuff like that. Twist rates of barrels gas volume and duration for semi-automatic rifles is is uh, something that's considered. You know, all, all the things that happen inside the firearm is internal ballistics. External ballistics is, are all those things that we look at from the muzzle to the target. So when the projectile leaves the barrel, flight time, the velocity it leaves the barrel in, atmospheric conditions, stability limitations of a given projectile, all those things factor into ballistic coefficients of, the, of a given projectile. Those are all described in external ballistics. And then terminal ballistics has to do with what happens when the projectile hits the target. So we consider, you know, penetration, bullet expansion, weight retention, temporary wound cavity, permanent wound cavity, uh, and does a projectile completely permeate a target? Those are all those are all factors uh, of terminal ballistic performance. So it's kind of three different categories. Uh, I mean, we're looking at kind of the same event, but we're breaking it down into these different categories. Okay. Moving on to barrels, how big of a role does the barrel actually play in the accuracy of a rifle? Well, the barrel is is a component of a system. And and just like a lot of systems, if one component is, is lacking, it doesn't matter how good the rest of the system is, you know, you're only going to get so much performance out of it. So barrels are as critical as anything else. You know, with respect to that, you can have a, a rifle that's set up as perfectly as it can possibly be in all of the respects. 
but if you have a, a marginal barrel or, or a barrel that's out of spec in some way, that will be the limiting factor in, in how the system works. Oh, okay. That brings up the question as far as we often hear barrel harmonics thrown around, and it sounds like this mystical, magical thing. <laughs> what, what are barrel harmonics, actually? Okay. When, uh, when you shoot a rifle, uh, when the projectile goes down through the barrel, recoil starts as soon as the round is burned. The inert weight of the projectile and the gas is driving shooter and rifle backwards. The barrel flexes, and, and it actually bounces, kind of like a, if you think about a diving board. Um, it, it, all barrels flex. It's not something that we can see or feel, but it, it absolutely happens. If you think about uh, a, a guitar string or something like that, you may not necessarily be able to see that guitar string vibrating, but it absolutely is. And that, that same harmonic takes place with rifle barrels. And so the more stable that harmonic is, the more accurate the rifles tend to be. Engineers describe what it takes to actually flex a, a given structure. They, they talk about it in terms of sectional modulus. So if you have a support at each end of a, of a structure and you put force in the middle, the amount of force it takes to make that flex, that's what it deals with. And so the bigger in diameter a barrel is, and the shorter it is, the higher the sectional modulus will be. The longer, skinnier barrel will have a lower sectional modulus and therefore tend to have a more dramatic uh, harmonic. External factors will, will affect it, like uh, if a stock has pressure or if, say, a sling, a sling swivel is attached to a barrel, the barrel is going to shoot, or like on, on FAL-type rifles that have a bipod that's mounted to the barrel, mm. all of those external factors change the way the rifles shoot because we're, we're introducing external forces on that barrel instead of letting it have its consistent harmonic every time. Okay. So now you mentioned something, inter- or you brought up something interesting, which is, you know, fat and skinny versus, or I guess short and fat versus long and skinny, to, to put mm-hmm. it in really simple terms. Right. And when you look at like bull barrels and things like that, is that what you're really trying to do with a bull barrel? Right, exactly. We're, we're looking for a barrel that has a more stable harmonic than a lighter one. Okay. And moving on to barrel length, is that, you know, you see these, these rifles, especially when you get into the bolt action rifles that are like 23 or 22, 26 inches. Mm-hmm. Is that about squeezing out accuracy or is that about squeezing out velocity? Well, it's about velocity and as it equates to effective range. So depending on what cartridge you're working with as to what kind of barrel length is, is really optimal. Calibers like 308 Winchester, 223, really optimize in about 20 inches of barrel. Now, I've, I've built rifles with much longer barrels and those cartridges will make velocity beyond those barrel lengths, but you reach a point of diminishing returns. And so with bigger calibers like, say, 338 Remington Ultramag or 338 Lapua, uh, I've built those rifles out to as long as 32 inches. Oh, wow. Because you've got so much case capacity, you know, you're burning 100 grains of powder, you know, instead of just burning it off in the atmosphere you're actually letting it build velocity. So the the whole accuracy versus barrel length thing is a throwback from the days when the front sight was bolted out there on the end of the barrel. And so the further apart front and rear sight were, theoretically, the greater accuracy potential a given rifle would have. These days, people rarely put sights out on their barrels anymore. Most of us shoot some sort of an optic for long-range shooting. Mm. So barrel, barrel length has no effect on accuracy whatsoever. But like the discussion before about the, 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 the transition from supersonic to subsonic, the further out that happens, the longer effective range we can expect the rifle to have. So that's really the effect of, of barrel length uh, with respect to accuracy is, is trying to get a projectile to go fast enough that whatever our intended range is, our projectile is still going at supersonic speed. Okay. And I guess anybody who's in 
gets into rifles and is in it for any amount of time, they pretty quickly start hearing about free-floated barrels, uh, both in semi-auto and bolt action. What does that really do? I guess, first, what is it? And second of all, what does it really do? Right. So free-floating the barrel is isolating the barrel such that those external forces do not have an effect on its harmonic. Think about most AR-15s you've seen. They've got a, a sling swivel that's riveted or pinned on to the gas manifold, which is on the barrel, and we have a sling on it. So if a man shoots that rifle with a sling, he will exert forces on that barrel that can change their harmonic, especially with respect to how little or how much you know stress he puts on that sling. On F10 FALs, that uh, a lot of them came with a, a bipod that mounts to the barrel. The little bipod legs fold up into the, to the forearm, and they fold out to shoot it on the bipod. That makes a significant difference in the way those rifles shoot with and without a bipod. You know, again, it's external forces. On both action rifles, we tend to talk about it in terms of having the barrel, nothing touching the barrel beyond the end of the receiver. And, and I know you've probably seen guys at gun shows or at gun shops and stuff, they'll get their wallet out and take a dollar bill out and slide it between the barrel and the forearm to, to make sure that that is, is a free-floated condition. Mm-hmm. So that tends to be the optimal for, for precision shooting, is to isolate that barrel and let it do that same harmonic every time. You mentioned something interesting a minute ago as far as with ARs that have a sling attachment on the barrel itself. Right. Does, and I guess this could be a very gray area, and well, maybe, or it depends, but if you actually take that off the barrel, does it make, can it make the rifle more accurate, or does it actually yes. end up ruining the harmonics that the manufacturer did? No, no, no. Um, taking it off the barrel and ideally uh, putting a free-floating forearm on. So instead of the, the original plastic two-piece handguards, that, that also represent external pressure or external forces on the barrel and put a free-floating forearm. So, you know, every, everybody and their brother makes one these days, DPMS, Yankee Hills Machine, Midwest Industry. There's just tons and tons of, of free-floating forearms on the market. They all effectively do the same thing. They bolt onto the upper receiver at the end of the receiver, and they don't touch the barrel from there on out. And so that allows the barrel to have a consistent harmonic. And then generally we attach the sling swivel to the free-floating forearm. So we're taking that that external force out of the equation. Okay. So now in the world of precision shooting, I know barrel makers is almost like a religion. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and I know you love this question coming up. So is there really a p- particular barrel maker that is just the end-all, beat-all, or is it mostly just bunk and pretty much all the tier one barrel makers are all kind of the same? You know, like you said, people have almost religious beliefs about barrel makers. I you know, talk to people all the time, oh, I would only shoot a, you know, fill in the blank, Pacnor, Schillen, Rock Creek, uh, Lilja, whatever. And because those, <laughs> those beliefs are religious in nature, I don't argue with them. You know, <laughs> if they want to. They want to give him barrel. They're the man that, that has to work with the rifle, and that's what I, I give them. My observations about barrels and barrel makers is they're all really, really good. Mm. With rare exception, have I, have I ever had a problem with a given manufacturer's barrel? And on the rare occasion when it does happen, I've sent those barrels back to manufacturers, and they were all too happy to replace the barrel. So, and it doesn't happen more with one than another. So, yeah, I, I think that your your observation is right. All, all the well-known barrel manufacturers make really great products, and, and I don't know that there's enough difference that you could justify or scientifically prove that, yes, this one is much better than another. The way the barrel is fit to the gun is probably a much bigger factor than who actually made the barrel. So... And I know a lot of those high-end barrel makers and, and actually even some lower-end barrel makers do fluting and all kinds of other interesting stuff to it. Right. So what's really going on with fluting? Okay, most of the barrel manufacturers will discourage, especially if 
you talk to them about a precision rifle, most of them will discourage fluting the barrel. Back to the sexual modulus thing. So you take a given two barrels, one fluted and one not. If they are the same weight, if, if you pick those two barrels up and they weigh the same, the fluted barrel will tend to be have a higher sectional modulus than the unfluted barrel. Because if you think about it, if they weigh the same, then generally the fluted barrel is going to be bigger in outside diameter, and so it tends to be more stable. But if you take a given barrel with a given sectional modulus and then you flute it, you will have lowered the sectional modulus. It will actually be easier to flex that barrel once fluted hmm. than it was before it was fluted. So, you know, I think for the purposes of taking weight off of a rifle, yes, there's an argument to be made. But if you, one of the things that uh, people oftentimes talk about or, or I guess worry about is how fast a barrel heats up. And when, when barrels heat up, groups tend to string one way or the other, up, down, sideways, diagonally, whatever. That stringing is caused by the fact that the outside diameter of the barrel is not concentric with the bore of the barrel. So if you think about this piece of metal, it's a long bar of steel with a rifled hole down it. If that rifled hole is not perfectly down the center of that, then as we heat it up, it will tend to flex one way or the other based on the heavier and thinner side of the barrel. That's what causes that to happen. Ah. When you flute a barrel, you exacerbate that problem. So for precision rifles, I generally counsel people away from fluting a barrel. Some people just have to have it because there's a cool factor involved. <laughs> you know, I get that. And so I flute a fair number of barrels, but I always tell people, hey, look, if you want the absolute most accurate rifle, don't flute the barrel. Mm. Now, how big of a role does the rifle stock actually play in the ac- in the uh, the accuracy of a rifle? Well, like we talked about on the ARs, free floating that barrel that is the the real heart of accuracy. As far as the butt stock goes, a fixed stock will generally be more stable than an adjustable stock. You know, there's there's a lot of really good telescoping stocks on the market today but none of them are as solid as a solid stock. Now, there are adjustable stocks that are adjustable for overall length, for length of pull, and for comb, you know, the adjustable cheek piece. Mm. But for all intents and purposes, once those adjustments are made and they're locked down, they work like a fixed stock. On bolt-action rifles, this stock is, is a critical, critical factor for some actions more than others. But it's always it's always a factor. Free floating the forearm part of it that's critical. The interface between the receiver and the stock is also critical. Less so for actions like Remington 700s or Savage 10 110s, where the 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 receiver is tubular in, in form. Receivers that have a flat bottom like Mausers 77 Rugers to a lesser extent Winchester FNs. Those actions tend to flex much easier than the round tubular type actions. And so for them, the the stock to receiver fit is absolutely critical. For the tubular type, they're a lot more forgiving, but optimally your receiver to stock interface should be as stress-free as possible because the stock can actually flex the receiver. And if you if you're flexing the receiver, then the bolt is not locking up the same way every time. That's really how the stock factors into the accuracy equation. As far as the interface with the shooter, the style of stock, that's kind of a personal preference. Some shooters just have to have stock adjusted exactly perfectly to their liking. Other shooters can pick up you know, any stock rifle and go to work with it. They're not nearly as sensitive about it. But with respect to mechanical accuracy, that... Uh, receiver to stock interface is is a, is a huge deal. Okay. Now with triggers, weight is always a really big thing. And mm-hmm. I guess first we should address is the weight of the trigger have anything to do with the accuracy outside of the shooter themselves? Right. Well, the the trigger weight is more again about the interface between shooter and firearm. Some people, you know, are a lot more sensitive about it than others, and so it's you know it's largely personal preference. 
I really, when I set up rifles for people that are going to take them into field, say it's a hunting rifle or a, a long range uh, rifle, about two and a half pounds, I think, is a good trigger pull. I don't think that that trigger pull is so tough that most people can't learn to work with it and do some outstanding shooting. Certainly competitive rifles that go from the, the case to the shooting rack at the range, they go from that rack to the shooting bench, they're shot, put back in the rack, back in the case, and go back home, can, you can get away with much lighter trigger pulls. And then for, for novice shooters, say a firearm that's going to be used by a young person that's just learning to shoot or someone who's not really that familiar with firearms, I think a little bit heavier trigger pull is a, is a safety consideration. So different people will require different things with respect to trigger pull, and I try to talk to them and find out what the application is what the skill level of the person that's going to use the rifle is, and then make some decisions based on that. Okay. Funny, when you were talking about two and a half pounds, I have one rifle that's one and a half pounds, and it's act- I actually find it's too light. It's too right. easy to set it off. It's I mean, it really is a hair trigger. Some of the set triggers, when you set the trigger, so you, you cock the rifle, you know, put a cartridge in the rifle, close it up, you pull the set trigger, and usually have an audible click, and when you touch the other trigger, when you feel the pad of your skin touch it, it's gone. Mm -hmm. Those set triggers are are a real specialized deal, and I don't see them as much as I used to. It's kind of a throwback from the days of old, and uh, these days the quality of the aftermarket triggers that are available are such that you you can get really good reliable triggers without having to go to a set type trigger. So now what's the difference between a two-stage trigger and a single-stage trigger? Okay, two-stage, single-stage is generally something that we see with the AR platform rifles, and there's quite a few manufacturers that make both. I think that the two-stage trigger is probably most applicable for people that are doing strictly target-type shooting. So they're at the bench, and they're very deliberately you know, taking up the slack until they feel it touch and then going ahead and pulling it through for, the, for the, the trigger to break. The two-stage triggers, you know, lend themselves best to that. But for situations where people are shooting either quickly, multiple shots, say like a, a practical rifle competitions or USPSA 3-gun, the single-stage trigger tends to, to work a lot better because they're shooting fast and trying to get as many accurate shots off as they can quickly. So a single-stage trigger most closely resembles a trigger in the pistol or, or a shotgun. So I think that they both have their applications and from the, the people that I talk to, that seems to be the kind of the two, the two camps for single stage and, and, and two stage. Interesting. Magazine or box fed? And I know this is one of those things, like if you go just look at a plain Jane Remington 700 off the shelf, almost all of them, at, I mean, most of the bolt actions in general ship with that, kind of old-fashioned hinged box mag as opposed mm-hmm. to uh, like a, a detachable, a detachable right. magazine. Mm-hmm. So is there a real difference? I mean, does that cause any accuracy issues at all? No, there's real, this is not something that really applies to accuracy insofar as it's really more about, uh, about convenience, you know, being able to either unload the rifle more quickly or reload the rifle more quickly. Now, uh, there's an argument to be made that a lot of the detachable box bottom metal for bolt action rifles is a better quality or heavier duty than say the factory hinge floor plate bottom metal. And so an argument can be made that you get a, a better, again, receiver to stock interface with heavier, bo- heavier duty bottom metal than you would with the factory. So, you know, there, there's an argument to be made that that facet of it can make the rifle more accurate. But as far as the box mag versus the fixed or detachable box magazine versus the fixed magazine, really no no consideration for accuracy there at all. Okay. So is it just more of a, just that's what traditional hunting rifles were like, and so that's what people wanted to stay like? Well, you know, it depends. My thinking as far as, as hunting rifles go, and especially rifles that were going to be taken into extreme conditions, a solid bottom, say like the Remington ADL or, or something that has a completely solid stock on the bottom is useful in, in that you don't get 
sand, mud, uh, in some cases snow, uh, in, into the rifle because it's you know there's just one less place for all that stuff to get. Mm. You know the hinge floor plate would be slightly less sealed up than that. The detachable box magazines, uh, because of the nature of that, they tend to be more open to get um, you know debris inside the inside the action. So, I mean, I guess, I guess that'd be the consideration as far as the difference in practical application. Now, what would you say your pet peeve biggest myths are around rifles when it comes to precision shooting or long range <laughs> shooting under under a thousand yards? Because obviously, we can go much longer than that, and it starts to become even more specialized. Right. Well, you know, I guess the big myth is, is that you can buy skill. <laughs> so, and, and that may sound odd coming from somebody who makes their living building equipment for this purpose, but, but oftentimes people uh, have the, the tendency to think that, okay, uh, I spent this much on this rifle, so therefore I'm going to be able to just go out and shoot a thousand yards like I've been doing it all my life. And, th- and that's, that's just not true. Um, I remember uh, Jeff Cooper was credited with the saying that, you know, having a firearm doesn't make a person any more armed than having a guitar makes you a musician. Hmm. And so the truth of the matter is that there's no substitute for practice in building those skills. And that's really a, a huge factor in, in this long-range shooting game. Hmm. You have to put in the range time. Uh, I realize it's not glamorous. People don't get excited about thinking about it. But that, but that is the truth. I don't know. I can't think of many things that are better than spending uh, spending a day on the range. Right. But absolutely. yeah, a lot of people just want instant instant skill. Right. Well, we're you know we're a gadget oriented society. Mm. You know, we want to we want somebody to give us a pill and that's going to fix it, or I want to buy a piece of equipment and I'm off to the races. And you know, there's a, a human factor and a skill factor in there that cannot be ignored. Yeah. Now, when it comes to cost, we can start to break this out more as far as semi-auto and bolt action and custom versus off the shelf. But Mm -hmm. when it comes to precision rifles, we'll just start with bolt action for the 500 to 1,000 yard range. What is somebody typically looking at spending? You know, honestly, most people could go and buy a standard or just off the shelf Remington or Savage rifle and put a reasonably good scope on it, and start there. And it will be a long time before the equipment holds them back. Now, that said, you know, a lot of people want to start out with a higher-end rifle, and, it, you know, it doesn't have to be, you know, tens of thousands of dollars. Um, you know, you can, like I said, you can start out with just a basic rifle and, and go from there. I, I think that... Uh, you know, probably on the low end, you'd probably spend about twelve to fifteen hundred dollars. You know, as far as the big end, you know, the rifles are like golf clubs; you can spend as much as you want to on them. <laughs> mm-hmm. So now, in the world of semi-autos, what is that? What does that range end up painting out like? You know, honestly, that range. You know, for a time, the semi-automatic rifles were were horribly expensive, and and a lot of that I think was attributed to the you know, some of the scares and politics and stuff like that. That stuff has, has calmed down, and the prices have come back down to, to uh, uh, you know, a very reasonable point. There's not a big difference as far as the cost of, of a bolt rifle versus semi-automatic rifle anymore. There, the, the differences there are really uh, getting smaller and smaller every year. Hmm. Now, you know, with the, with the semi-automatic rifles, you know, I would expect to spend about the same thing as far as an entry level deal goes. And then with the, the more toys, the more options, the more custom features people want, you know, obviously they're going to become more expensive. Mm-hmm. So now when you start stepping into toys, like what, like what you make and by toys, I don't mean to diminish them, but you know, fun, fun things we all right, want. Right. What does that world start to, I mean, obviously it's like golf clubs and go sky's limit, but what is sure, getting exactly. into a custom made rifle start to, to you be know, like? the average, probably people spend somewhere between 2,500 and about $3,500. Mm. But oftentimes people will match that amount with the scope they put on it. <laughs> <laughs> so, I can't tell you the number of people that have come in and said, okay, 
when you get all done with this, I want you to bolt this scope on here. And I'm like, we just double the price of this rifle. Mm-hmm. So, but yeah, that range is, is, is probably a good range as far as what people have me build on, on a pretty regular basis. So now as a shooter yourself and a gunsmith and everything else, and you brought up an excellent point about optics, what is your general personal rule of thumb on glass as far as are, are you of the the mindset of you should probably spend about as much on the glass as you do the rifle or well my rule of thumb is you can't hit what you can't see mm-hmm. <laughs> so everybody needs something a little different um i've i've got uh you know law enforcement snipers the biggest scope they have is a 10 power scope and, and these guys win sniper competitions out to four and five hundred yards with nothing more than a 10 power scope uh, for me personally, and, and as I get older and my eyes, you know, aren't what they used to be, I, I really tend to gravitate towards more magnification. Uh, and depending on where you're going to use the rifle as to what kind of light gathering and light transmitting capabilities you need, generally a 30 millimeter tube scope will let more light through than will a one inch tube scope. Of course, these days they've got, you know, up to 35 millimeter tubes, and I'm sure there's bigger stuff on its way. Uh, but oftentimes people will buy scopes with huge, you know, there's like 56 millimeter objective and a one inch tube. And that's, that's kind of flawed thinking. Mm. The other thing to consider too is uh, with respect to light transmission is fixed power scopes let more light through than do than variable power scopes because they have fewer lenses in them. So, if light is a factor, the bigger the bigger body tube and fixed power will let more light through than the smaller body tube and, and the variable. But as far as price goes, you know, I, I generally recommend for people to go somewhere where they can actually look through scopes themselves because you can read about it, you can read reviews, you can talk to people, but until you actually hold it up to your eye and look through it, you don't know how your eyes are going to experience that. So going to to either gun show or some of the bigger retailers these days have got some really elaborate displays where you can actually pick the pick the optics up and look through them, and I think that that will tell people more about what to expect from that optic than anything else. And then the old deal about you get what you pay for absolutely holds true with optics. So again, you can spend as much on the optic as you do on the rifle. I don't know that I would necessarily use that as a rule of thumb, but you can expect performance commensurate with price to hold true most of the time. Mm. Ed, if people want to ogle your, your beautiful work and everything else, how can they check out all the great work that you've done? I have a website. It's uh, www.vandenbergcustom.com. Most of the, the stuff that I do is on that website. Uh, if the people are in the Houston area, I show at the Houston Gun Collector Association gun shows. Uh, we usually hold those three times a year. I'll be at that show, and I'll have tables out there where people can handle the firearms and look at them. Or they can make an appointment and come to my shop, and I'll be glad to show them different examples and talk to them about you know what their needs are and give them some information that might help them make some good decisions. Awesome. Well, tell us your website address one more time, Ed. Okay, it's www.vandenbergcustom.com. It's spelled V-A-N-D-E-N-B-E-R-G, custom.com. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us today, Ed. Very good. Thank you. And now your special Halloween treat from author Lauren Wilson. Season's greetings, listeners. Lauren Wilson back again to share another recipe with you. This week, I'm sharing my recipe for Ah Nuts Crusted Rabbit from my cookbook and culinary survival guide, The Art of Eating Through the Zombie Apocalypse. Fall is a great time for foraging nuts, so get out there and find some using the foraging guide I provide in the book. Then, snag yourself a rabbit and try out this tasty preparation. Check out the recipe online at intherabbithole.com, or find my full book, The Art of Eating Through the Zombie Apocalypse, online at Amazon or at a fine bookstore near you. And stay spooky this October. With that, we wrap up episode 146. As always, you can get links, resources, show notes, Lauren's recipe, and the ability to comment on this episode by visiting www.intherabbithole.com e146. And don't forget, 
to help support the ITRH mission by becoming part of the Roving Horde Armada. Visit ITRH.net today to learn more. From the Lone Star State, till next time, stay safe and sound.